love to have you work with me to see how you can fit within my office. choose the industry, it more so chose me, <laughs> but, it, but I, I want to shed light on her willingness to be obedient to her call and to, to be a service person, a servant leader herself, because without her call, without her taking this, and assuming the role, I would never be here. Mm -hmm. um, so again, without any prior experience, I'm now working with Assembly Member Reyes, and you know it's all about We are connected yeah. and how divinely connected our assembly member is to this region. Without further ado, our assembly member Eloise Gomez. <laughs> Thank you, you know what's so exciting? I remember that day, Daryl, and I told my staff, I said, we need him on our staff. He said, all you have, you your, your, your budget doesn't allow it. I said, well, you figure it out, because we need to bring him on at least part-time. He can do the rest of the stuff part-time. We get him part-time. I'm so glad that I've been fighting and fighting. They finally increased my budget. All right. Daryl now is our full-time. I'm so proud of him. Thank you, President Rodriguez, for your kind words. Uh, she's an awesome leader here. In fact, she's such an awesome leader that she has been selected out of almost 60 nominees for Woman of the Year. We had 23 finalists. Uh, Diane Rodriguez is Woman of the Year for the 47th Assembly Woo! District. Yeah. Where is it if, we, if our job as elected officials is to serve the community. We have to find out where the community is and where they feel safest. Where is their sanctuary? It's not going to be in a state building. It's not. Where is their sanctuary? Where do we reach the people so that we can then tell them about the services that are offered? It's in their churches. Wherever their church is, wherever they choose to be, that is where we want to be. Today is an opportunity for us to come together in light of our differences. As you know, we have so many faiths represented today, and you will hear from many of, uh, of our representatives from our community. It's an opportunity for us to begin the construction of the bridge here in the Inland Empire. Somebody once said to me, Eloise, why don't you include the entire San Bernardino County or the entire state? I said, because I represent the 47th Assembly District, and this is where I want to begin. And if something can grow from this, that's good. But the 47th Assembly District has one representative in the State Assembly, and it's me. And it is my job mm -hmm. to do everything that I can for the 47th Assembly District. All of you hold an important brick, an important brick that is irreplaceable. Your brick is unique, and we need the brick of every one of you. All these bricks are molded by your diverse backgrounds and beliefs. Each brick is inscribed with your own values, heavily weighted by the testimonies of your lineage. The brick you hold is not only welcome, it is necessary. And as we join together to build the foundation of this bridge, we must rely on cooperation, right? <laughs> Now more than ever, it's important that we stand together. We must understand that we are working in faith. We will promote peace and interreligious harmony as we, as we go through today. We must remember that the strongest adhesive that connects us is love. Love is action. Love is infinite and ongoing. It's service. Love is what binds us to the bridge that gaps our community. Air pollution, mental illness, or a struggling economy. We all share the core, the core goal of advocating for the people. Today, <coughs> over eight world views will be represented by our workshop leaders, speakers, panelists, and all of you. To prepare, to prepare for today, I'm proud to share that 
Last week, I introduced to the state a re resolution that made history because it had never been offered before. I introduced House Resolution, or HR 85, which declares the second week of March as Interfaith Awareness Week. And I do want to share with you that over 60 of my assembly colleagues joined on as co-authors of this House Resolution, and it did pass unanimously. Brought some copies. Roxana has some, and Daryl has some. Field Representative Maha Rizvi. Field Representative Daryl Peden. Daniel Peden. He has, he has a twin named Daryl. But Daniel was ours. Daniel Peden. And the newest Field Representative who helped to organize this event today, Daryl Pride. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to the bridge. The bridge we're all going to build together today. Thank you so much for coming. I um, deeply appreciate the invitation to speak to you this morning, and I want to begin by expressing an admiration that I have, and I'm sure all of you join with me, in having for Assembly Person Reyes the important ways, those programs that promote justice for all. And she has developed, as Diana Rodriguez mentioned a little bit earlier, an ability that I envy to be in three places at once. <laughs> I'd settle for two, Eloise. The faith community that uh, many of us come from is a diverse group. And often that diversity has brought about a tragic kind of parochialism and isolation. There are some things that we need to share that need to overcome our differences. Individually and collectively, we of the faith community, and particularly those of the faith communities of the Inland Empire, bear a responsibility to the wider community of which we are a part. I'm reminded of a classic story which I'm sure many of you have heard, but it seems to bear repeating this morning. It seems that there was a country church looking for a new preacher. They found someone, and before he came to preach his first sermon, he was told that you need to be aware that there is one member of our church, a farmer, who is especially cantankerous, who is critical and frankly he's obnoxious. But he's a member of our congregation and he's given every former pastor a rough time. He was highly critical of the sermons and he didn't hesitate to share his opinion with anyone. And he had done the same thing with numerous other pastors that had served the church before. So this new pastor who was about to he interviewed, uh, he said, things don't go well for me, but when he arrived on the scene, he decided that he would devote his first sermon to a passage from Scripture that is well known to many, the Ten Commandments. And he spoke about the Ten Commandments, and afterwards, that very critical, cantankerous, obnoxious congregant, who also happened to be the major benefactor of the church came up here and was just glowing with praise. So the pastor was elated and so he decided that uh, since he had done so well in satisfying that critic that they warned him about that maybe the next Sunday I'll speak about the Ten Commandments again but maybe in a little bit different form. So again the congregant at the end of that sermon came up that lauded him. In the third week the pastor who was bolstered by his success, uh, decided that he would speak not about the Ten Commandments in general, but about the negative commandments, the thou shalt not. And again, after the service, he was approached by that congregant who said, uh, Pastor, your first two sermons were great, but this was even greater. You are doing 
an absolutely great job. And so not one to mess with good fortune, his sermon on the fourth week was just even a little more specific. Thou shalt not steal. And this time the congregant was equally, maybe even more generous with his compliments, and he told the preacher that he had done superbly. The next Sunday, as the pastor was well into his sermon, that congregant got up in the middle and explained to the congregation, I'm never going to set foot in this lousy church again. I've never heard such terrible preaching because, see, that morning, the pastor had decided to speak about thou shalt not steal chickens. And that was too close to home for that congregant. Religions and religious institutions and clergy and lay leadership are mandated to offer comfort to the disturbed, to bring solace to those who are sorrowing and to calm the waters and to lead people into what we poetically call the green pastures. And by and large, our religious institutions elsewhere and I would say in the Inland Empire too, have done quite well in discharging that function and that responsibility. We provide in our own faith communities, community gatherings, that we hear about our commonality. We have expressions of brotherhood and sisterhood evidenced by our institutions, but when we are in our own institutions among ourselves, we call into question the authenticity of our neighbors. We perpetuate stereotypes and prejudices rather than doing something to undo and reduce them. You're broken down, tired, living life on a merry-go-round. You can't fight the fire
and have it submitted. Yeah. She's, she's amazing. And I want you to join me again with a round of applause. There's so much more that identifies us. Yes, we studied, and yes, we do have the title, Juris Doctorate. Yes, we did pass the bar. Yes, we do practice law, but there's more. So I want to introduce to you, from, from the Baha'i faith, my dear friend, Sohaila Azizi. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. What an enchanted morning it is. We started with that beautiful prayer, prayer connecting us in heart and soul and blessing us with that reminder that we're all one. And then we have the, the president of the, the college, Ms. Uh, Rodriguez, welcoming us and telling us um, about how the community means coming together in unity and how this, this center would be an anchor for the community to, to do things like this and how we are all blessed to have the first interfaith uh, gathering in this holy place, um, any place where the mention of the Creator is made and our humanity is reminded um, that is a holy place. That, that's, that's my belief. He reminded us that we refer to our Creator with different names. So it's the same spirit, it's the same power that moves all of us to do good. So, where the founder of the faith, Baha'u'llah, from his prison cell, when he was exiled from his birth country, being from a royal family, he was being exiled in Palestine, a prison where all the murderers and, and criminals of the world uh, were being punished. He sent letters and tablets to the kings and rulers of the world, including Tsar of Russia, Napoleon III, Queen Victoria, and, invite, and Pope Pius IX, and invited all of them to be looking out and taking care of their people. And that to not forget that their position of power is just to help the people that come within the area of, of jurisdiction. And he asked them to abandon slavery. He asked them to disarm and work towards peace and unity. And that if they did not do that, dire consequences and bloodshed will fill the streets. And, and home. Now I think if we all look around us and look at just what has happened in the first couple of months of this year, we cannot agree, we cannot but agree that this is the dire consequences that some of those warnings have indicated. And if we do not come together and do the creator's work right this time, that even more dire consequences will come. My presence here is testimony to that. Also, thanks to Daryl for all his work and to Hill, who did a lot of work on this. In 2010, President Obama said, and I quote, This is a country that is still predominantly Christian, but we have Jews, Muslims, Hindus, atheists, agnostics, Buddhists, and their own path to grace is one that we have to revere and respect as much as our own. That may be the first time a sitting president made an inclusive statement about atheists and agnostics. Now the Center for Inquiry where I work, which is a community of pro-science, atheists, agnostics, and secular humanists. We work on a number of different issues pertaining to science, extraordinary claims, and secular people, both here in California and elsewhere. We publish Skeptical Inquirer magazine, among other publications. We have been debunking fake news since the 70s, by the way. We not only represent the four million atheists and agnostics in California, but to some degree we represent the 11 million nuns in this state. And when I say nuns, I mean N-O-N-E-S, not N-U-N-S. <laughs> um, Faith-based organizations too. 
Well, first of all, from our perspective, we think all people should be participating in their government, in that process of government. Everybody. Now, we are firm believers in the separation of church and state, separation of religion and state, but separation of religion and state does not mean that religious people shouldn't participate in government. It means that the great power of government should not favor one religion over another, or the religious over the non-religious. That's what that means. But the fact that you're all here means that you care about what happens in government, and I care about what happens in government. That's a good thing. In addition to the National Science Breakfast, or the National Evolution Breakfast. Forward to this, Daryl. I'm looking forward to as well. Assemblymember uh, Ray has made it a point that we look at the battles we all face. Right? And a lot of our differences, we really go through the same things. Mm. Right? And it takes for us to be the leaders, not only in our faith, but really leaders in our community. Right. So this next portion of our conference will be breaking up into the passion areas that you all have in your heart. So go ahead and open up your workshop conference pamphlets. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, tell you guys, join it. Figure out how you can provide resources, not, not only your family, but your organizations. We have health and nutrition. We have innovative outreach, which says, hey, how can I innovate my organization? I know the trends are changing. I know there's a lot of millennials nowadays. How can I bring that new, fresh ideas to the community? We also have environmental justice, another pain point that our assembly member really likes to look into as far as legislation. So if that's your passion point as well, go to that workshop. And we also have the natural, natural disaster awareness preparedness workshop. The earthquake and our wildfires, they're inevitable. But how can we really get prepared to make sure that we are ahead of the curve? Perfect. You ready? What? Hi, I'm Fozzie. I'm here. Okay, I got it. So most of her presentations are in Spanish. And the, 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 the crowd is always so pleased when they see, oh, thank God Alexander's going to be there. Because her commitment. To, to the youth, to the homeless, to, to the, the marginalized, to the immigrant community has been phenomenal. She is an absolute leader and I appreciate so much that the bishop has put her in a leadership role to, to reach out to the community. Petra, thank you so much. It's been an amazing day. And I thank you so much for taking, for dedicating so, many, so much of your time to us, to this issue, to this, to this conference here with us. Thank you so much. Now the next one, we're going to have a panel where our panelists please come forward. Yeah. They will be introduced individually in just a moment, but I would like to introduce your moderator, someone who helped us with the ideas and with some of our panelists, born to Hindu and Sikh parents. He currently serves as one of the first among three interfaith ministers in residence for the Episcopal Diocese of Los Angeles, is a fellow for the Reimagining Re Interfaith Conference in Washington, D.C., and serves as a religious director in the Office of Religious Life at Beautiful. the University of Southern California, USC. <laughs> he is the youngest board member for the Southern California Committee for the Parliament of the World's Religions, serves as an interfaith and youth liaison for Sadhana, Sadhana, I love being corrected. And you know what? It won't be the last time because I'm sure the next time I have to say it, he's going to say Sadhana. I try, I try, I try, I try. Um, where am I? <laughs> a coalition of progressive Hindus, and also served as a youth representative for the United Nations for the Global Parliament of the World's Religions. Above all else. Tahil is my friend. <laughs> we, we have known each other for some time, and if you are, ever want a lesson in Spanish, Tahil is your man. He is your man. I, I never would have imagined that. Um, honestly, I never would have imagined until he started speaking Spanish to me, and I realized, Tahil is another skill I didn't know about. So, Tahil, take it away.
Good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes. Um, it's an immense pleasure to be here, to be a moderator for such a distinguished panel. Um, start with the illustrious Senator Kanyuleva. She was elected in 2014 to represent the 28th State Senate District, which includes the cities and communities of Newton, Chino, Colton, Fontana, Grand Terrace, Montclair, Muscoy, Ontario, Pomona, Rialto, and San Bernardino. <laughs> Ernest Cisneros. He was appointed to the position of council member for the city of Colton in September 2017. And I'd also like to introduce um, Pastor Samuel Casey. He is the senior pastor and founder of New Life Christian Church in Montana. The Lord led him, along with his wife, Pastor Tamika Casey, to launch their ministry in August, in October 2013. Pastor Casey also serves as the executive director of Congregations Organized for Prophetic Engagement, also known as COPE. She focused on providing safe, affordable housing for seniors, local access to higher education opportunities, beautification of open space areas, funding for the city's new library, and economic growth providing jobs for local residents. When I was a little girl, we all we went to church every Sunday, uh, but my dad didn't go. So it was my mom would take my brother and I. And it wasn't that my dad was anti-Catholic church, he just wasn't real religious like that. Uh, my mom went all through parochial schools, uh, but she said she didn't want that for my brother and I. What she wanted for us is she wanted to, us to come to our faith um, not having it, not, not, well, I won't say beaten into us every day at school, as she said it. <laughs> so we'll say she just wanted us to come to it on our own. Uh, and I remember we actually left the church when I was 12 because the, they had built on a new, um, like, rec room, and they sent out a letter to everyone, every family. And I did not grow up, we grew up poor. And they said, if you do not donate to the building of this, don't ever ask to have your child in their events at this particular rec room. And so that really turned my mom off to the faith. Now, fast forward to my husband and I got married, both Catholic, we get married in a Catholic church, and we raised our girls Catholic, and uh, they did three years in um, at a Christian Catholic high school. And I think it was excellent for them. I actually like that they had God in their life every day, especially in that critical time in their life when they were teenagers. And for me, my faith really is, I know that God has a plan for all of us. And I know for me, I, when I think times are tough or I'm not really sure what direction I'm to go in, I just pray harder because I know he's going to lead me in the right direction. And I think that um, I didn't get there until I was probably about 25, the year our twins were born. Uh, why do I feel the way I do now? What was I so upset about and so afraid of and so challenged by in my life growing up that today makes me a better lawyer, a better soldier, a better leader. From St. Bernadine's High School in the city of San Bernardino. And having a very strict Catholic upbringing, mass every morning, uh, every, every class, every period started with a prayer. And it wasn't the same prayer. It was a different prayer for every class. And each, each one of the nuns, each one of our teachers, felt that their prayer was designed so that our mind would better be prepared to learn in that next 45 minute period. Then along comes life. Because as long as you're a minor, you got parents in one way or the other who are looking out for you and paying the electric bill, the water bill, the trash, and you've got a little shelter, and with God's grace, you get along. But when you become an adult, that, ladies and gentlemen, is the true university that you graduate from. And you graduate by going through that darkness, feeling that pain of disappointment, of being the underdog, of being left out, 
uh, going through um, the process of reconciling your own lack of self-confidence, figuring out why do people bully other people, why do people hurt each other, only to find out that many times the people you love are the people that hurt you the most. And you stand there and you ask, why? Why is this happening to me? Why me, Lord? You know, as the senator said, can't you give this cross to the person across the street? It's probably the really like them now. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact is that every cross, every challenge, every obstacle, every disappointment, every time someone said no to us, it was really the Lord teaching us how it feels to be treated that way. So because he was giving us the opportunity to never, ever make someone else feel that way. Yeah. And that's very important. And I hope um, I use that in my in my professional business career, in my political career, and I hope that you all always find in me that um, I have been beat up, I have been kicked around, I've been tossed around, tumbled around, and I know what it feels like, and I do anything that I can that I might never make you feel that way. Thank you. Like many of you here, you're trailblazers. My mother was also a trailblazer in the city that I grew up in. Um, she was the uh, second woman to ever be elected to city council, and the first Latina. Um, and, uh, but that didn't go over really well in the church. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we stopped going. But my mother never lost her faith. In fact, she was the one who brought me back to it. Um, as um, when she first um, had her first bout with cancer, that was the one thing that she came to, to. She had a conversation with all of us and said, I have to. This is the only thing that I have that's worth anything. It's faith in God. You must, you must seek it out and search for it and find the faith that um, the opportunities that I've had being a member of a wonderful congregation um, has allowed me to be in a safe place, a safe space to grow as a, as a man and a human being um, and to be able to see and look out and see how I can help my neighbors to be of service. Um, I, I feel so, so humbled to be a part of this today. It's extraordinary. Um, and I feel very blessed to be in the position that I'm in. I will always be person who says, what can I do to help? And I'm knocking on doors of my neighbors and meeting them and saying, what can I do for you? That's all I want. That's all I want to do as a council member is what can I do? We've been to uh, this panel. Uh, so, so, so honored and privileged to be here today and to all of you. Um, if I was to explain my journey, uh, I grew up in a family of faith. Uh, from my grandmother, great grandmother, I have an uncle who uh, was a pastor in St. Louis. So it, it was as if uh, I was born into a family of faith. Uh, and not only of faith, but one that practiced our faith. Um, if I was really to take a look at my journey, it started out in religion that ultimately ended in relationships. Amen. Uh, many of us struggle with the whole idea, specifically this generation, what it means to have faith and or religion. Uh, I believe religion, as I experienced it, was my attempt to get to God when the reality is he already had come to me. Uh, and when I, when I discovered that, it gave me uh, answers for uh, the rumbling I always felt in my spirit as a young child, daydreaming of events like this. Uh, so this is not something that's new to me. This is just really fulfillment uh, of an aching that I've always experienced as a child something new. This is not a surprise to God. It may be a surprise to me and us, but I know I'm supposed to be here at this very moment. So my agency uh, is not only my faith, but as a community leader. So I am a Christian who just so happens to be a community leader. Um, um, I, 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 my faith is not, a, is, is not a debate. It's an announcement. Um, so, so I don't have to, do, when I was younger, you know, fire, I, you're going to hell. <laughs> because I was ignorant of certain things. But, but now my, my faith helps me to be in a relationship uh, with everyone that's in the room because it's an announcement, not a debate. Um, and so we can walk together in, in unity and walk together uh, and, and serve together because it's about humanity. But then when it comes to talk about our theology, 
it's up to you to receive or not. The lack of religiosity and spirituality does not mean moral diapers. There are reasons why there are institutions of education and government that have to be secular, because inclusion, diversity, and pluralism are their norms. But each one of these institutions also has an open door policy to our accountability as constituents. And we need to live by those ideals every day, regardless of our worldview and our political leaning, to make sure that all of them are accountable to us. What are some best practices for religious and activist communities to best engage with your office or organization on issues that matter to all of us here in the state of California? I bring this up because the story behind this conference started with me and assembly member Reyes. This actually started as a conversation in her office of her saying, Tahil, can we do an interfaith conference? Mm. And it was like, almost like a marriage proposal. <laughs> it was almost, I mean, that, no offense, Frank. <laughs> It was, a, it, was a, it was a marriage proposal for my interfaith work, per se, because this started a new conversation on what the institutions of church and state look like when they're in a dynamic partnership rather than just separated by the wall that's called law and order. Mona Ontario, Chino Moss there, come up and meet with me and ask the exact same question. And they said, how do we do a better job of making sure we're all working together? So what we committed to was getting together. I told them, you tell me, is a month too often, bi-monthly, quarterly, and let's sit down and let's talk about what does it look like? What does politics, what does government look like with our churches? And how do we do a better job of educating our youth? And how do we do a better job of making sure that folks in the church are active with their politics and active with their elected officials. So, that's it. <laughs> they work together to enrich the quality of a community, uh, improve the lives of families and individuals in ways that we still hesitate to embark on. Perfect example of two worlds coming together to make something positive happen. I think that all of us care about homelessness in, in our communities. Um, and finding out how to do it, I, I can, the, the church that I come from or that, I, that I've been involved in has been feeding the homeless for 33 years. You know, I just have been a part of it for the last 15. Um, but you're right, it stops. You say goodnight, good luck. Uh, that's not enough. Uh, so I think that that's a uh, common to, to most of us and to most of our congregations. We need a bridge. <laughs> I agree with what my colleague just said. I, I believe this is an opportunity uh, to respond to the moral and the territory, uh, ensuring that our most vulnerable populations, including the homeless, first of all, uh, are no longer criminalized mm. uh, because they are homeless. The reality is we live in a country that does not afford access to everyone while claiming to provide access. Um, so, so here are some issues uh, as the executive director of Coke Congregations Organized for Prophetic Engagement that intentionally does uh, policy engagement and uh, capacity building of faith leaders and community leaders uh, to work in uh, tandem and even in partnership with our local elected officials. Here are some issues I believe that has brought us together uh, one of them is ending mass incarceration. Um, we must continue. Um, see, that, that, that crosses all lines, whether you're in faith or out of faith. We can't keep locking up people and then expect them to come home and be uh, engaged if you don't do anything for them while they're incarcerated. Then bring them back to communities where there are no resources and then criminalize them for not being able to be civil. Yes. <laughs> um, the second piece is rethinking public safety. Um, we must stop locking up young people immediately yes. uh, yes. uh, and, and begin to provide them opportunities to have restorative justice provided in their lives mm -hmm. uh, that is ethnic and, uh, ethnic and culturally relevant. Um, that there, are, there are ways that we can deal with each other rather than locking individuals up. Um, we must also fight for racial justice. Um, 
here's another way that we can work together. That we and work immigration together. is more than a problem for our Latino brothers and sisters. Yeah. They are deporting Africans, yeah. Afro-Latins, yeah. Asians, and others. But the picture has been uh, that, that it's only Latinos and our Muslim brothers and sisters that whom we have criminalized. And it's the first step. There's a lot of work ahead of us when it comes to any of the issues that have been just brought up by the pastor just now. And it doesn't just require the accountability of our politicians. Yes. It requires the accountability on every yes. single one of us yes. as constituents, as human beings, yes. as people of moral conscience yes, that need to be on the front lines of these issues. So when you leave these doors today, you're already in the real world. So start walking in the direction of justice. Yes. This was our first of many. The bridge has to continue. Uh, we started this as uh, the, the, the first bridge, right, Daryl? Right, Daryl? Yeah. This is the first one. And next year, we want to continue to build this bridge. It is clear that we have elected officials, the presenters, but we need you. We need you because you're the ones that are going to help us build this bridge. You're the ones that are going to tell us this is what we need from the church, or this is what we need from our elected officials. We need you, each and every one of you. So important. I want to, to thank, I'm so glad that I, the marriage proposal was accepted. <laughs> And then when, when I got to Daryl, who had joined us, I said, Daryl, here's the idea. He says, the bridge. The bridge what? No, that's going to be the name of it. I love it. Mm -hmm. And the bridge was born. Thank our assembly members. In just yes. a brief prayer that Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, verse 21. Father, make us one, even as you and the Father are one. We thank you now, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.